Good morning and happy Sabbath. And today you are blessed to have two stories. So I was meaning to share with you one of my all-time favorite women. And do you know who she is? So those of you who know me, I really love this woman. And because she was in today's Sabbath school lesson, I'm going to bring it up today because there's no point in sharing a story that you've already done today. So um, this woman has really touched my heart deeply. Not only because I've sung her song and I've always liked that song from a young age, like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. But then I hear my Savior speaking, draw from my well that shall not run dry. Fill my cup, Lord, fill it up. And we have a kid's version, fill my cup and let it overflow. Yeah, fill it up, fill it, fill it. Yeah, those songs at a time, spoke to me. But this story touched a chord, and I, I'm still trying to figure out why I love this story so much. And this woman at the well, I, I, I love, on the, as you know, I love underdog stories in the Bible. I love outcast stories for more than one reason. I was always treated as an outcast, always, always treated as an outcast. I'm in a group, and I'm always the outcast. I'm always the one picked on. I'm always the one blamed. I'm always the one mistreated. I'm always the one paid less. Yeah. And even when I go to the doctor, I'm in the 1%. Yeah. I went to a doctor recently and he was like, oh, well, it's not what I think they were thinking the worst, but you are in the 1%. And I don't know what he, he expected my response to be, but I wasn't phased by him. He, was, he didn't even know the word. I finished it for him. You mean the 1% doctor? <laughs> And he looked at me and his eyes perked up. And he was like, it's not the first time you've been told this, right? No doctor. But you're not phased. Doctor, every time I'm told I'm in the 1%, I'll be dead by this if I'm phased by it. I'm over being in the 1%, doctor. I'm over being in the 1%. God, I've, doctor, I've been in the 1% in all of my life, to be honest, to tell the truth. So I'm in the 1% club and I'm okay being in the 1% club. I'm not started by the 1% club anymore. I'm not concerned about being in the 1% club. Like that, the club God put me in, I'm going to be a good member in the 1% club. And he was kind of shocked at my response because he was like, I guess most people he tell that they're in the 1%, they would have been upset. And But by the time I met him, I've been told I'm the 1% who have this, I'm the 1% who have that. I am over in being a 1% club. He couldn't even find the word. But the memory that comes to my mind when I think of the story this morning is a day in Detroit. You know, I love Detroit. <laughs> I must love Detroit. I talk so much about Detroit. Uh, Detroit has made me where I am in a lot of ways. And in my chaplaincy journey, yeah, yeah. Uh, in my chaplaincy journey, Detroit has molded me in some ways. Thank God for those experiences that I didn't want that he gives me. Those experiences like her story that we didn't think we need. And like this woman, I was walking along, the hospital is in an H, for those who know the hospital. And I was walking from one leg of the H, just visualize the H, and I was walking from the sixth floor, which is the top of one H, to across to the next leg of the H. And as I make my journey across the my nearer team had just upset me again. Nothing new. I mean, a couple of days and I had to ask my manager, wait, you forgot to give me the memo. Don't you think it would have been better you tell me what I'm coming into so I can prepare myself than just... She wasn't even truly sure of the full consequence of what I was dealing with. Have you ever wondered why none of your chaplains sit in the seat for more than a year? Come on now, don't you do the homework? Well, she is new. Give her the credit. She's new. But nobody's ever sat in my seat. I don't know how long the predecessor that everybody expects us to live up to. I had to tell them, look, I lived, I live off nobody else's shoe except one person's shoe, Jesus. So I'm not going to be somebody else. I'm not going to lack my boundaries that I've spent the last two years working on. No. No. I'm going to be me. I mean, the way I dress offended some. The way I walk offended some. And the fact that I advocated offended some. The fact that I didn't ask any question, I just got in and get the job done, offended some. So everything about me offended somebody. You're too confident. You don't ask any question. You just get on with it. You spend so much time with the patients. Oh, the way you work makes us look so bad. I didn't know I was competing. No, I didn't know. I'm not working for you. 
this institution only pay my check. I'm working for a higher power and authority. Okay, so when he gives much, he expects much in return. And he has given me much. Thank you. So I don't come here to compete. I don't care what you do and what your integrity is. I know where my integrity is and to who I respond. And they didn't get it. They watched what I wore. They watched... Oh, you, you, <laughs> that's a joke. You make us have to dress up. I don't make nobody dress up more and be me. You said professional in your job description, right? This is professional according to my standard. Okay, you you dress in your, your, your sub, sub, sub professional. I'm gonna be comfortable in my skin. So don't watch me. So th this is the backdrop to the story, my Detroit life. <laughs> But what I want to share with you before I get into the story is, and as long as I sit and I, I listen, and, and I was listening to the story, I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, I had an encounter like this where I was upset. I was had enough. Another day of having enough. I've had so many of those days, have enough. And I know that God has says, stop fighting against me. You're trying to leave and I, I want you here. And I'm like, I don't think I was at a point yet where I'd surrendered fully to being there. And as I must up and I was fuming inside and I was walking briskly and I could hear my shoes as I talked to you clicking across those concrete corridors as I walk across the leg of the H and I'm like, I'm so done. But you come here and you, and you, you don't see a chaplain, you know you don't have a chaplain. I, I was inside and I was fuming in my mind. I was just giving it to God. I'm so done. Like, why do I always have to be the rubbish bin? Why people always think I'm the easiest to disrespect? No matter how you smile and you're nice to them, they just disrespect you because of the color of your skin because of the blessing you pour at me. They just, and as I walk into this woman's room, she was mad too. <laughs> Some doctor had offended her too. And so I had to, <laughs> being a good chaplain, and I went in and I, uh, I, I, I um, hello, good afternoon. How, you don't look too well today. What's going on? You're upset. And as usual, I just let them gush it out and I listen. It's not about me. I passed that a long time ago. <laughs> it's not about me. This this is their baggage you're carrying. So let them let it out. It's not going to move me. So I'm so sorry that you had that experience. And as usual, but well, you didn't do anything. Why are you always apologizing for them? I'm a part of the system. So if the system offend you, that means I get caught into that bigger organizational stuff that we miss when the organization offend people. We're part of that organization and we are part of that. And this world doesn't get that, yeah? So this woman told me my whole life story in a few fashion seconds. She told me how my church mistreated me. She told me all the people in my life mistreated me. And I was standing there just like, she told me how I prayed, even how I prayed to God and what I had stopped doing and what God wanted me to continue, which God was already telling me. And I'm like, this woman is either a prophet or the devil from hell. <laughs> And her goddaughter was there, introduced her as a prophet. And I'm like, what do you do with this information? I started praying. I'm like, God, don't let nobody speak into my life that is not from you. This woman was telling me my life story without me saying a word to her. And I'm just standing there, is smiling, and I'm like, is either this the devil from hell or God himself tell this woman my story? Because there's no way this woman would know my story like this without somebody tell her. And I don't know nobody in Detroit. And I don't know this white woman or this black woman. I don't know her from hell or Adams. And she was there reeling my story out, reading my pain, the abuse, systemic abuse I've been through, how my church mistreated me. And she said these words, your church don't even know the value and the word to few or the purpose God has for your life. And I'm like, woman, <laughs> this church only used me and used me to resurrect the dead and just flung me to the side and never any appreciation. If I was living for appreciation, forget it. <laughs> she told me my life story that day. And I was hooked because I'm like, there's no way this woman know my story like this. And she was spot on. The part where we were part of company was where she said, why don't you come and join my church? We're looking for you, pastor. Huh? You do what with us. We, we see God value and work in you. I'm like, okay, you're a son of the church. You're the, why son of the church recruiting me like this? The other son of the church was recruiting me like, no, tomorrow in Detroit. I tell you, I would have been in the church a long time. I mean, they saw value and work in me. And that's nothing. My church doesn't see no value and work in me. They don't. 
They just use me. Use me. Use what God gets me with. Yeah. They don't see no value worth in me. No, they don't. I don't even deserve a license. Yeah. They don't see no value worth in me. But they want me to work in their church and they give me the lowest of stuff to do. And I'm just sitting there laughing. I'm like, you all think you're prideful and leaders and you don't think Jesus, Jesus, Jesus was a servant leader. And you talk about servant leadership. Jesus work. He doesn't point fingers. He work. He does the dirty work himself. And so this woman was there telling me my story. Then she invited me to come and join her church. And I'm like, woman, I'm like, even when Adventist church bite me, and even when the Sabbath church bite me, I'm still a Sabbath keeper. And no, I can't do Sunday. Can't do Sunday. No, I'm convicted on that one. Sorry. But this woman told me my story. And I had to hold back tears. Or she just wrap up my story in summary. Took the point at the T. Name stuff that I was struggling to name. I was saying it, but not directly. The institutional abuse, the work abuse. The abuse of people who call me friends and family. This woman just told me my story. I mean, I turned up a CPE and my supervisor said, why do you take this? Why do you always take this? This didn't even know me for a week. <laughs> Maybe it was about, no, it's about, she said to me, and my second unit, my supervisor said to me this. Well, I'm going to say this to you. Why do you take this from people? And I'm like, I, she said, you always fight for people, but never for yourself. Thank God for CPE. CPE is work on me. Thank you, Jesus, for CPE. But that woman saw in me what I saw in her the first day we met. I turned up in CPE, and nobody would tell me what CPE was. I know I'm drifting a little bit. What, I'm, we're in a story. We're, we're in a story, trust me. I saw her, this Chinese woman, from Hong Kong. <laughs> and I saw myself in her without each of us saying a word. I don't know what it was about her, but we connected. And this woman was sharing a little about herself and also assessed her personality style. Of course, I got it wrong. I got it right with spot on. And my colleagues were like, how do you get everything right? As she says, and I just smile. Okay, <laughs> intuition. <laughs> I saw in my, she was sharing a poem that she wrote on top of her rooftop walking and having a conversation with God where she was under the stars and she was having a moment with God and it wasn't a moment of joy. She was spilling out the beans and parading on top of the rooftop and I'm like, yeah, that's something I would do. Yeah, yeah that's something I would do. And both of us sussed each other out without saying a word to each other. So when she told me that, she was, she said, my supervisor told me this is my second unit, but I'm going to tell you in your first unit, hey, why do you make people trampling you all the time? Huh? What's in it for you? That was her story. She was being trampled on right there and then. That was her story. And she saw it in me because we had a lot in common with my sister from Hong Kong. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's get back to her story. So her story is about this woman at the well. And this is her story. She was used by society, trampled on by her history and her bigotry. And she found herself living in Sika, one mile from Jacob's well. And this woman come in the middle of the heat of the sun to draw water because she was the talk of the village and the town. And everybody knew her story about her. Rabbinic laws only allowed three marriages and she found herself up in age and not married, having been with five men. And the one she hit, she was no longer married to because she had no money to give no more dough to them. She had nothing else in the youth to offer. And she didn't want to be alone because a woman who's a widow is going to sit at home and have no one to take care of her. And if you have no children, it make it worse because there's no one to work and to hand you anything to eat. This woman's story, whichever part of the bigotry you take it, was grim and dire. She was used by society and an outcast by society. She was institutionally discriminated against. She was a talk of the tomb by women who go to the well. So she went a mile to get water, a mile to get water, being ostracized by the very people who every time they see her would talk to her. So that day she came to the well. She didn't have full understanding. She knew Jesus. She was a Samaritan. Either she was moving to the land as being a Samaritan or she married with the Jews that were left in the land. But somehow they worshiped God at Mount Gerizim and they also was looking for the Messiah. But they have some little idol worship and some of the little customs. Because we look at the Samaritan today, they dress white in Israel and they, they do stuff a little different in, in, in than from the Jews. So they were outcasts from society. This woman came at the well 
and she did just what broken people do. She was sarcastic. When we're hurt, sometimes we become sarcastic, yes. And we make sure we dab first at people when we're hurting, so they don't dab at us first. So of course she had, which was the day of the order of the day. Hey, you had been a Jew asking me for a Jesus had a deliberate detour. He wasn't just running because his disciples were arguing and tiffing with John the Baptist, the disciple who baptized more. Jesus could have gone the long route around. I know he wasn't hiding for his life, but Jesus never let anyone took his life. He disappeared in crowds <laughs> when they wanted to trim over the cliff, cliff before time. So Jesus, Jesus wanted to meet this woman and this town that was more ready than his own people. A lot of us in the church think we're ready to meet Jesus, but the people on the outside who don't look like us is more ready in their heart than us. And God is going to bring them in to take all places. And there's this place for everybody. So no one needs to take your place. So this woman, my favorite woman in the story, and she comes to the well. And Jesus was there talking to her and she was there being sarcastic, being woman, <laughs> witty and, and charming and, and, and witty, too witty for their good sometimes. And she said, so sir, <laughs> you asked me for a drink. So for, you know, travelers normally walk with this belt that they would use to drop long in wells for water. And like maybe the disciples had it and they'd gone to buy bread. And Jesus didn't want them around because yeah, he sent them to go buy bread. He knew the woman was going to be there being the all-knowing Messiah. And he was like, lady, can I have a drink, please? Jesus have a way of pointing out her needs. She thought that he was thirsty, but Jesus knew that she had an inner thirst, a deeper thirst than she even recognized at the time of coming to the well. And you will see that with her leaving a water pot because now she had the real deal. She had no need to take that water pot anymore. So Jesus came to this woman at the well and she, there she was at the well, ready to drink, or get her water. I come one mile not to be disturbed and you man, you Jewish man, sit at the well. Not that I know only the discuss of the people of my town, or you come here asking me for water to take a joke out of me. But let me take a joke out of you first. So sir, uh, okay, why are you asking me for drink when everything about me is unclean? I'm unclean because I'm already know my baggage that you don't know, that I think you don't know. I'm unclean because I'm a Samaritan. and my very water pot is clean. I'm like a dog, right? Half read, right? All cats. So why are you asking me for a drink? Let's get back into the cultural baggage because you understand the story much, much better. And so Jesus asked her for her drink and she was there being sarcastic and being herself. Taking out what the town has taken out on her. On her. She can't face the town men, but here she is talking to Jesus, facing him. <laughs> One person would talk to her. It's so funny how about Jesus, how he meets us and how he used our very thing about us to reach people. But this woman, ostracized by her own people, met Jesus at the well. And so when she met Jesus at the well, Jesus was like, okay, give me a drink. She had a look at charade and Jesus let her have a charade. Like Jesus always made me have my teeth. <laughs> okay, you upset? Let it out. Are you done? No, God, I'm not done yet. Give me a few more minutes. <laughs> Are you done now? Yes, God, I'm done. Now it's my time to talk, Claudia. Okay, go ahead, God. I'm listening. <laughs> Give me those moments. Yeah. So Jesus and this woman at the well had delayed the conversation. So we move from water at the well. So Jesus said, Give me living water. But Jesus, what are you waiting on? Give me the living water. You know, I come here a mile in the broiling sun for water. And now you have living water. Give me so I don't have to come here again. I don't have to face my shame. I don't have to walk a mile in the sun. Yeah, have you ever carried water on your head in the sun? I've carried enough pocket of water from work so I don't want it's gone. And that's more than a mile to know it's difficult. And if you see those big jars, that 20 pound jars that they carry in the air with water. If you take my five, my umpteen gallon bottle bucket to my neck stiff from work so you have the water. So if you've ever carried water on your head, you know how difficult it is in the sun. And that was like nine o'clock, 10 o'clock sun after walking back and forth, several trips to get some water from work's yard. So I know what it feels like to carry water on my head. So this woman carrying 20 pounds a jar on her head for a mile, I feel your pain, lady. In the broiling sun, midday sun, I feel your pain. So this woman carrying the jar of water on her head, and I'm like, not to be the talk of the town, just to hide and the one who's good at avoidance. She was avoiding her very pain. Not that she doesn't know it already, but everybody's already telling it to her. She just wants a peaceful moment. So she goes a mile for water to drink. And here this man come, knowing her more than she knows herself. So he talk about living water. Then we got to Mount Gerizim, the place of worship. We're not going to get into all of that today because I've already shared some of the time with my experience. And Jesus knew that she was having a deeper anger, as he always does. God has been putting me in touch with some people this week. And I'm like, God, why are you giving me all these people? We're between the lines who they are. And I'm like, how am I going to tell them with, when your word says so-and-so? Well, I did tell somebody something yesterday. And, I, and it, God, you're good. God, you're so good. 
will you bring things out? And I'm like, ah, uh -uh. that's not the meat of the matter here. <laughs> Let's leave that for another day. Jesus met the woman at the well. God have a way of making you meet people. I was telling somebody last week, I have learned as a chaplain and as a trainee counselor that all the people that come in my life, either teaching me a lesson or I've had an experience at a patient encounter, know somebody who's been through it. And that's why I'm the fit for it. No skill of my own. God has either put me through it. So this woman met Jesus. And after she's had her encounter and he told her everything, well, she was so dumb to the whole story that she was talking about the physical living water. And the water from the well is stagnant. And if you ever have a well water, well water don't taste good. Even when you boil it, it still don't taste good. So can you imagine Jesus asking her, running water, living water? It was still, they said Jacob well was living water because it was running from a spring underneath. So it wasn't as dead as regular well water, they said. But the woman knew that what Jesus was offering was more than she ever thought she wanted. By the time Jesus was finished and meeting a spiritual need, that woman left the water pot, same place. Remember, John talked about light and darkness. So she was struggling to look at the light in Jesus. But by the time Jesus finished the conversation with her, she was looking him straight in the eye because he has now given her a new transformation, take the scale from her eye, give her a new vision and interpretation. Jesus has cleansed her from her past shame that she went to the very village who ostracized her and said, come see a man. I like the way she evangelized. The woman wasn't the one who shared her story. We don't evangelize, right? We are afraid. This is what we call use of self in chaplaincy and use of self in therapy. You need to know when to use self appropriately so you don't steal the show, but you share the story and you bring back, you build connection and trust and you bring back the story to the person who is talking. Okay, so we talk about that another day. So the woman, you self. You all know my story, right? In the village? Come see a man who told me all I've done. And you all know all I've done, even more than I have done. And you have judged me or cast me. She didn't say, this is the Christ. She said, isn't this the Christ? <laughs> the village was ready and waiting. Jesus said it. Their hearts were in the right place, even though they were seen as outcasts. They worshiped God not the way they should have. Like a lot of people who are outcasts in our society today. They want to be part of God's kingdom, but they don't fit the bill. Their lifestyle don't fit it. By the end of the day, we are all sinners that all level playing field at the foot of the cross. God has shown me some insight into that yesterday. How do I tell them that? Yes, God says you are condemned. But isn't an adulterer condemned? Isn't the Bible says if you're guilty of one sin, we're, we're all condemned? But in Jesus, we are free. And it's the Holy Spirit that works on us and transforms us. And that's not my job to do. My job is to give you Jesus. And it's up to you to let the Holy Spirit work on you. And he will change in you what you change in. Like he changes woman at the well that day. She became the first person that Jesus declared that he was the Messiah openly to. The only person, as a matter of fact. Jesus never even answered Pilate. They say you're the king of the Jews. Jesus said, oh, so they say, I'll keep quiet. But this woman, this outcast, this woman, yes, woman, not man. Jesus declared, I am he who speak to you. Her heart was in the right place. She was ready. And a lot of time, I'm going ferociously and I have to give some of the story out. But God sees you. He sees you've been devalued. And he still sees worth in you. People might disrespect you. People might treat you indifferently. People might think there's no worth in you. And you might be working, working like your heart out to be somebody. Like many people I meet every day. And I have to say to them, this job doesn't make you a person. This title doesn't make you a person. You're a person because Jesus says you're a person. Whatever they think of you doesn't work account. It's what God think of you matters. That's who you need to go pour your heart out to. And we're making church a social club, excluding people and telling them they're going to go to hell. And maybe they are. I don't know. That's not for me to tell. Where are you going is a question. Stop ostracizing people. Let God do that. Let him be the judge. Jesus met this woman because her heart was in the right place. And she was willing to go tell. We go tell what we want to tell, the way we want to tell it. And never tell our stories. So many people haven't found hope because we're afraid of sharing our story. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, we lift you up, we magnify your holy name. God, help us at this woman. To find your living water, that, that we will not thirst and hunger and, and drink from broken cistern anymore, Lord. But we will find you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Yes, yes. That was Fast and Furious. And that was my favorite story in a nutshell. Bye.